Hello everyone, welcome to the Rook intro and deep dive with Seth Talk. I'm here with Blaine. Yeah, I am Blaine Gardner. I am a storage engineer at IBM. <laughs> and rec maintainer. <laughs> Hello, I'm Uwit Wasserman. I'm Seth and OpenShift Data Foundation, which is Rook and Seth and lots of cool stuff in OpenShift at IBM, architect at IBM. And I'm JC Lopez, so I do uh, pre-sales and consulting and whatever you want around Rook, Seth and anything containers related to storage. So, and real quick to myself, I'm also a maintainer of the Rook project and um, working for Code Technologies Inc. as a funding engineer. Okay. So, what do we want to talk about today in the Rook intro and deep dive? We want to give you an introduction to Rook and Seth for anyone who's new. We want to talk about the state of the Rook project, what's in the making, any cool features we have cooking up, and uh, some real life example. And additionally, which I think is interesting for a lot of people, also the newcomers to Rook, is application disaster recovery. And especially also day two. Because second day operations, well, first day it works, second day it's uh, broken, we don't want it, so let's talk about it. So, first of all, a few questions. Um, who's here to learn about Rook for the first time? Quite, quite a few people. Has any one of you already experimented with Rook? Okay. And who has Rook deployed in production? But like, I guess we can see production as a bit of a stretchy term, even like in test environments or so. Okay. And question which is not on the slide, um, where do you run Rook? Do you run it on, uh, in the cloud, in a virtualized environment? Hmm. On-prem? On <laughs> okay. On bare metal on-prem then? <laughs> A uh, few more people, okay, on prem and bare metal, okay. Um, yeah, let's talk about Rook. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's see. <laughs> um, yeah, to get us started, I want to talk, talk about just kind of an introduction to Rook, starting from the very beginning. What are the questions that led to Rook? Um, so, in a, in a cloud world where cloud providers are usually providing storage, what do you do in your own data center? And also like why, you know, what, what storage is normally part of, uh, or like not part of the Kubernetes cluster, but why, why can't it be in the Kubernetes cluster for the Kubernetes cluster and then managed in the same way as Kubernetes applications? So these questions, and some iteration led us to some goals for Rook. And so that's make storage available to Kubernetes applications and have them be Kubernetes native, um, just like the storage that you would get from cloud vendors. And we also wanna make that easy. Um, so automating the deployment, the configuration, upgrades. And at the time we were seeing this new operator pattern and how good it was. So we wanted to, to implement that and use that and leverage that. And we also wanted to make sure that it was open source, that it's like free for whoever wants it. Also, I think understandably, the project did not want to roll its own data uh, platform. Uh, but instead looked at existing data platforms and what they offered and settled on Ceph. And some of the reasons why Ceph was chosen is because it is a distributed software-defined storage solution. It provides all three major types of storage. It provides block, it provides shared file system, and it has best-in-class support for S3 APIs and is often even bug compatible with AWS. And beyond that, it's, it was already wi uh, widely trusted in enterprise, used by thousands of organizations. And something that, that I find just personally very cool is that an old, uh, like a, a very long time Ceph contributor and user is CERN, who uses it for their Large Hadron Collider and their particle physics data. Um, and they have one of the largest Ceph clusters in the world. 
Um, additionally, Ceph is very durable. It's designed to be consistent. So it's not eventually consistent, it is consistent. Data safety is Ceph's priority. Um, and it does this by offering sharding, and this can be across availability zones or racks or nodes or disks or whatever, you know, whatever structures you have in your data centers. The replication is configurable, it's durable, and even in disasters, uh, we've seen that it's, it's used all, almost always possible to manually recover data, even in the worst possible disaster. As far as the architectural layers that we're dealing with, um, Rook itself is really just the management layer. Um, CSI, we also have a, a container storage interface driver, and this dynamically provisions Ceph storage and then mounts it to user applications so that when user applications are running, they get access to Ceph, which is the data layer, uh, as directly as possible. Neither Rook nor CSI sit between Ceph and the application, this application directly to Ceph. Installation can be via Helm charts, via tons of example manifests that we have. Um, and there's also a quick start guide uh, at rook.io. I saw someone taking a picture. I'll hold here for a, a second if there's anyone. Um, and you can just click get started and, and that can get you going. Um, Rook can be installed, in short, anywhere Kubernetes runs. This can be on cloud uh, or on premises. You can have virtual hardware, bare metal hardware, and even the underlying storage, it can be disks attached directly to your nodes. It can be uh, cloud volumes even, like EBS. And if you're just looking to do some testing, we even support loopback devices. If you already have a Ceph cluster, Rook can attach to it and then help offer that native solution using pre-existing storage. And all of this kind of adds up to Rook being something that helps with cross-cloud support. Um, something that's dear to me is uh, object storage provisioning. So Rook was an early investor in um, self-service provisioning of object storage buckets. Um, so this was done with a project that uh, provided object bucket claims. Uh, and this was like back in 2019, and that evolved into a uh, Kubernetes enhancement project now, which we're uh, helping to try to like usher into beta, uh, which is uh, uh, this cozy project, the container object storage interface to allow a little bit more flexibility there. Um, I'll pass it back to Alexander. Yeah. So to talk about the uh, Rook project in the community, as Blaine pointed out, the Rook wants to be open source. It's always, as far as I'm aware, has been open source on the Apache 2.0 license. We have, uh, for communications, we have Slack, GitHub discussions and so on. And uh, what is especially vital to any open source project, there's also quite some big companies behind it that maintain, contribute to it, and uh, it just shows in the numbers of contributors to the GitHub project and the amount of uh, container downloads, which I think we're already at 400,000, I think now, but the uh, number is always a bit hard to calculate based on like which architecture and the old uh, Docker Hub um, download counts per architect adds. Well, a lot of people use it, a lot of people like it. In the end, it's the magic of an operator for self storage in Kubernetes. We have uh, graduated as a project from the CNCF and, um, well, it's been quite some years, 2024. It's <laughs> October 2020. It's, um, it's been some time, but it's a time where, as we've graduated project with most of them, it's more and more yeah, evolving into what people need, making it even easier for them to run the self storage in Kubernetes. And, um, yeah. well, I partially, uh, partially talked about this already. As I said, we've graduated since almost four years now. Um, it's already been declared stable for quite some years. Um, even, yeah, as a maintainer, I think saying it is always a bit uh, finicky, but I've been running Rooksev for like 
oh damn, six years, <laughs> seven years or so. And um, as we had it with the questions where people run Rook already, like for example on-prem, on bare metal there, that's exactly my use case um, that I was able to cover with it in the beginning and well, still am. And um, yeah, I said with the companies that contributed, with people being able to use it as it is on the Rook project and downstream as a product, it's showing how stable it is, especially also nowadays and with more and more features, making it more and more targeted towards the Kubernetes environment. Regarding the release cycle, we uh, try to do a release every like four months. That's the schedule. Um, we have uh, the, well, in December, 1.13. So this year, December, right? Yeah, 1.13 coming this December, 1.13 in the next year then, and we on the go have the, uh, regular patch, uh, patch releases. If there's not necessarily anything critical, there are sometimes also smaller features which are able to be uh, put into the patch releases as well. So, um, yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> that was still my slide, right? <laughs> well. Go ahead. Okay. That's fine. So, yeah, so uh, one of the things about you know, all the real life um, things that we've seen is that we see that Rooksef is just like good, getting everywhere really. It's really, there's a great adoption to that. And um, obviously the collaboration we have with different like uh, universities and other places. So you can actually watch um, a talk that we did right here on that link that will tell you about the partnership that we have with all the different institutions around the globe. And it's, um, it's very interesting to see where it's actually popping out and who's using it. It's just like any geos and the different types of universities. So it's really interesting to just like go through that. Wanted to tell you about um, application and business continuity too. And this is something that we didn't really have originally. We were really focused with Rooksef, thanks to Seth on high availability and uh, the fact that the cluster would remain operational, even if a, a node was to go down or a single drive used to go down. And as we saw more and more stateful applications getting into the Kubernetes environments, obviously we realized that we needed more than just high availability. So we started other projects and we're gonna name them on the next slide. And it was, how do we do DR on top of HA? Uh, in Kubernetes environment for stateful applications. You know, state lays are slightly different, so we really focus on stateful. So for those who are not familiar, we just come back on two terms, RPO and RTO. So RPO is recovery point objective. So where is the data when you're gonna be able to do the recovery, right? So what basically what amount of data have you lost uh, until you can restart the application? And RTO is recovery time objective, which is how long is it gonna take you to get the application back up and running. So HA, remember what we said, so the Kubernetes cluster has built-in HA and Ceph has the same functionality that basically maps, so it uses different protocols, but Ceph has built-in HA with the monitors, maintain the cluster map. So even if one month dies, so because the, the monitor itself crashes the pod or the node where one of the months is running goes down, we're still highly available, so we behave and we're aligned to like, with what basically Kubernetes does. So we can limit the actual physical topology of the cluster. So when we deploy the Rooksef cluster, we can specify where we want the components to go. So we can, like, if you have a Kubernetes cluster that is multi-rack, so you're gonna be able to apply that very same topology and tell Rooksef, well, deploy my components aligned to the rack so that if I lose an entire rack, my cluster is still highly available. So we can even just go even further. We can <clears throat> push to the extent rarely seen uh, to multi data centers. You could actually do that thanks to the Ceph topology and the features that we have built in Rook and the selectors and everything we use to select where the pieces go. Now, something that <clears throat> was missing kind of uh, in the beginning, a lot of people said, well, it's a Kubernetes cluster. You know, we, get, we start pods, we start application, but with stateful came another need, which is 
how do we back up and restore an application, right? The state of the data is inside a PVC, right? So we maintain the state of the data through that data. So what we had ignored in the beginning because of stateless became more of an evidence. We need to do what we used to do in all the ways of doing when we had like rail servers or mainframes or whatever. So provide the concept of backup and restore. So you're gonna grab the state of the application or all the CR secrets, config maps, whatever, and also the content of the PVC so that when you wanna do a restore, not only you restore the actual data, but you also restore the context of all the CRs of the application at the moment you took the backup. So that when you restart the app after the restore, you're in the exact same state. So very good for logical protection. Um, it usually offers a good granularity depending on the tool you use to do the backup. Some backup tools can actually do file level recovery, others do not. So every implementation and the, 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 the tool you choose to do the backup will just like be different and offer various levels of granularity when you do the backup, specifically the data that is actually on the PVC. Now the next step was how do we do DR? So business continuity and came like two concepts, Metro DR, so that you want to be able to basically lose the least possible amount of data and restart the application as soon as possible. So that's the, going to be the lowest, yep, the lowest RPO and the lowest RC, RTO. And we also have regional DR, where your two data centers are too far apart so that you can do synchronous replication. So you need to do asynchronous replication and you assume and you accept that you're going to at some point be missing some data because of the asynchronous replication process. So for HA, remember that's the built-in uh, Ceph thing for backup. So we have external solutions, can be Velero. For the people that run uh, OpenShift, it can be OADP-based type of backup and restore. Everyone uses, and that's the whole beauty of Kubernetes and the environment, so you really choose the tool that fits the bill. For Metro and Regional DR, so Metro DR actually leverages two separate Kubernetes clusters attached to the same external Ceph cluster. So when you want to do a failover, what you do is that you fail over the app from one Kubernetes cluster to the other one, and you reattach the resources, the persistent volume claims and the the underlying PVs to the application that is restarted in the other cluster. So basically you lose no data. Your RTO is basically the time it's going to take to trigger the failover of the containers from one cluster that died to another cluster. Always be careful. Uh, a lot of people like to say we want that as automatic as possible. There's always someone that needs to check if you really want to fail over because once you start the failover, well, before you, you are able to fail back, you need to wait for a full failover so that you avoid any problems. So you can automate that, but just make sure on the checks you do. Um, so we also leverage another project, open source project called Raman DR, that helps you automate the collection of the CRs of an app so that we can basically scale down the app in the source cluster if the cluster is still operational but you can also force the failover to say, I cannot contact that cluster, so I cannot scale down the app. But the project is designed so that if the two clusters and you want to test the failover, the project RAM and DR will actually scale down all the pods, all the deployments and everything in the first cluster, and then fail over the app in the other cluster. Regional DR is the same concept, except that we're going to do asynchronous replication between two clusters, two Rook Ceph clusters. So we uh, can do the asynchronous mirroring for RBD based. So RBD is a block device, virtual block device feature in Ceph. And CephFS is the shared file system that uh, Alexander was mentioning. So we do support asynchronous mirroring for the two types of PVCs. So depending on the app you have, some PVCs will, some PVCs will be RBD based and other PVCs will be CephFS based. In both cases, it's the RAM and DR that will um, take in charge or be in charge of the failover of the app between the two clusters. And Orit now is going to give more details about day two. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I want to talk a very important day two operation, upgrades. We all need at some point to upgrade the software. 
either to get a security fix, new features, bug fixes. And upgrades can be cool and important, but they are sometimes putting us a bit with risk if something goes wrong. Uh, and with WooksF, when we actually store your data, if something goes wrong in the upgrade, it means you actually cannot ac access the data also for other pods. So we need to be a bit more careful. And, and we have several dependencies that sometimes people forget about. So first one is obvious, the Ceph version. You can upgrade the Ceph version separately, but you need to make sure that you don't need to upgrade work as well. We support backward compatibility for a few versions, but sometimes if there's a big change in Ceph or a new feature, you have to upgrade also work. And uh, as, as uh, Blaine mentioned, uh, we use Ceph CSI to, to provision a uh, persistent volume. Um, it's basically bundled with Rook. So if you need a new SF CSI, you may need to upgrade Rook, especially for new features. And of course, in both cases, I always recommend use stable versions for production workloads. <laughs> Don't put upstream latest uh, workloads, <laughs> your workloads on. I actually always, never. I think upstream latest is only for us developer or if you try something. And then we have the Kubernetes version, and again, it's because Rook is an operator, you can actually upgrade Kubernetes without upgrading the operator. But, and we actually support at least, I think, around six version difference. But at some point, you may need to upgrade Rook because maybe Kubernetes changed API or even deprecated them or changed something in the CSI interface and you want to consume it. So don't forget. When you upgrade Kubernetes, there's the work operator to consider and look at the support metrics. And last, especially on-premise, Kubernetes runs on an operating system and you may need to upgrade that. And it's actually the hardest part sometimes. And we have uh, dependencies uh, with the operating system. For example, sometimes new features in the operating system are required for new features in CSI. Uh, we are working on quality of service for Ceph CSI that's going to use C group V2. You need new kernel for that. Um, we also use the Ceph kernel clients. If you need a new client that uses a new kernel, you will may need to upgrade your operating system. And another thing happens when you upgrade a kernel, you need to restart the nodes. And then uh, you need to drain the node. And at that point, first of all, it can take time. Starting physical servers can take a few minutes, sometimes long few minutes, large number. Uh, you may need to drain other pods running on your own node. Uh, it could be a database that needs to sync its state into the volume. It can be a VM that live, you need to live migrate. And in that case, uh, because you're actually stopping uh, the Ceph pods, you don't have access to the data. And we care about the data. We want to, in Ceph especially, but also in work, we want to make sure you're safe. So I'm go going to talk a bit about the AJ that JC mentioned and how we do it. So our default fellow domain is node. Um, what it means, we don't only place your data on different OSDs which maps to different disks. We actually store it in a different node. So if your node goes down, you still have two copies of your data. You have a quorum, you have a majority. If there will be an additional failure, we won't allow writes because then we have only one copy, we can lose it. And if the other two copies or if these are up, they would not know they are not up to date. So, so, you, need, so you wanna avoid two, con, con, uh, two failures in the same time. And we want to make sure that if you are doing an upgrade or any operation stopping the OSDs or other self pods, you won't get that situation of having one copy. So we use a very cool Kubernetes mechanism called PDB, Pod Distribution Budget, that allows you to define rules of uh, dependencies on a specific uh, types of pod, in our case, if a pod of type OSD is stopped, you cannot stop another pod with a different node label because the fail domain is known. Uh, we do support as better or more granular fellow domain 
uh, WAC and availability zone. Availability zone is basically like a co-located co data center, usually a bit far, not very far, but far enough that it won't be, it will be fault isolated, different power. So if there is a fault in a, in a zone, the other zone is not affected. You can see AZ is, is like a, the cloud concepts. And we can actually deploy WOOPSAF. We call it stretch because the, usually the network latency between the zones is high. Uh, and we make sure, uh, like mentioned, we have the mon self monitors. We put each self monitor in a different zone. Monitors are like the control plane for self. And we put, make sure. Do I, yeah, Mike. Make sure that each replica is in a different zone. So if you have a zone failure, you have two copies of the data and you can easily write to the data and also move your pods to the other zone and have the data. This is high availability. And again, here we use PDBs, but instead of node label, we either use rec label or zone label. Ah, so now uh, let's go back to the OS upgrades that require node restarts. Node restart, I think the, if it's not virtualized, will take more than 10 minutes, usually 20 minutes. Uh, so we want to make sure that the upgrades are not too long. So if we do one node at a time, so it's three nodes cluster, every fine half an hour. You, but we usually run larger cluster. So 30 nodes, five hours. And those who actually run really long, large clusters, 300, can get to 50 hours. That's more than two days of the cluster upgrading. We want to make it better. So if you use more better fellow domain, we can actually, if you think about it, upgrade all the nodes in the same fellow domain simultaneously. So here we have uh, three nodes, they're the same, but 30 nodes, if we split them, let's say, to three racks, 10 nodes at a rack, basically you can simultaneously upgrade in 10 nodes and you get the same time to upgrade as you have for three node cluster. Larger cluster, you would say, yes, I can do 100 node per fellow domain, but you don't want to upgrade 100 nodes. <laughs> this is not healthy. Things can go wrong. <laughs> so I would say you should do around 10 nodes at a time, and, but you still have an, five, only five hours for the upgrade. It's much better and faster. And you can ask, but what if I don't have this fellow domain physically? What if uh, the nodes are split on REC, so I cannot use REC fellow domain? But you actually can, because we don't look really on the physical hardware. We use the Kubernetes labels. So if you can actually manually add REC label, let's say you have 30 node cluster, you can add uh, each divided 10 nodes per a virtual REC, and this way you can expedite your upgrade. I want a question. A fellow domain should have at least five nodes. Why five? Because let's say you have two. So you lose a node. At that moment, we want to put the data on a different fellow domain. So in that fellow domain, we have one option, one node to write the data. And it's get even harder if you need to recover. If it's a long-term failure, you will have one node. Uh, self will start self, itself healing and you want to move the data in that fellow domain to a different node. But again, you have one node to choose from. Uh, so not only you have all the rights going to that node, also all the recovery traffic, and also you need the capacity. Uh, so that's why I recommend at least five nodes. You lose a node, you have four nodes to split the load on. Uh, so we presented your work. We try to start with the basic, the introduction for anyone new, and added uh, talking about business continuity, backup and restore, and upgrades uh, for those who are more experienced. If you have questions, want to hear more about Rook, um, want to hear more about Ceph, we have a booth in the project pavilion. We are there every day. Those are the hours. Uh, come ask us, talk with us, join the S community. Thank you. I think 
we have five minutes left as well. We can probably take some Q&A, I think. I think I saw a question over there. I don't know if there's a, a microphone that we have available. So, um, especially in Kubernetes, the PV is a small. <laughs> ah, yeah, I repeat the question. What's the benefit of running Rookseth on AWS EBS? So, uh, EBS, you pay for the size of the volume. But in Kubernetes, we usually don't have those big volumes. We have small, uh, and they're not all, all, also people sometimes try, let's say, I need 10 giga, but actually use one giga. So you don't want to do an EBS volume of 10 giga and pay for all the 10 giga. You want to be thin. And another issue with the EBS, for example, TP3, is the IOPS depends on the volume size. So small volumes have lower IOPS. You need at least one tera EBS volume to get really good IOPS. So you can install Ceph with one tera EBS volumes and then provision lots of smaller PVs on top and you get also, we are AZ, uh, EBS is pairs or AZ. It's not course AZ. And you, you can stretch it, and actually it's our default in AWS, to use fellow domain AZ, and then we put a replica in it AZ, so if you have a zone failure, you have the data in the other zones and everything is highly available. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, the question was whether we have any documents officially on sizing. Um, I don't, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we have any like really strong dedicated sizing guide. I think we defer to Seth's guide for that. Do you have any? We basically, yeah. We basically defer to the Seth documentation because in the end you can, to some degree, one-to-one -one map that to Rook Seth. Um, if you, for example, go to the documentation uh, for the CRD definition, there's, for example, the section for resources, there's at least a link if uh, um, you might not have that uh, link yet. Um, for sizing in regards to uh, disk sizes and so on, what's uh, amount of memory, there's some info in the Ceph docs as well. I think we also have like some notes on that. Um, besides that, I think it's best to also ask on the... Oh, well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's best to uh, ask on the rooks like um, with like what your what is your goal in regards to usable storage and so on like this would be a point to keep in mind there um, in regards to storage sizing not necessarily CPU and memory but like as a using the Ceph docs as a guideline is a good starting point no. I think we might be able to squeeze in one short last question Is it managed? Or... Hi guys. So my question is regarding encryption. Does uh, the Rook provide uh, encryption at REST, for example, or what kind of encryption it provides? Thanks. Um, yeah. So Rook provides encryption at REST, so you can encrypt the the like the OSTs, the the demons that run on top of each disk. Um, it also provides encryption in flight, and that's something that I think was added in uh, the 1.13 release, or maybe even recently in 1.14. Um, and then there are also like um, some different encryption options for uh, e yeah for each like PV or PVC. Yeah, I can add about the PV encryption. So we support for um, RBD-based PVs. Uh, we use DM crypt to encrypt the data, so it's basically client-side encryption. The data is written encrypted, and goes across the network encrypted and everywhere encrypted. Uh, for CephFS, RWX uh, PVs, uh, we depend on a kernel model called FScript. Uh, it's in the main kernel, but we are waiting it to get to, well, another downstream well Linux version and then we'll have also uh, for RWX PVs encryption. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think that puts us at time. But yeah, thank you, everyone.